Hello and uh, welcome to London Learning Lean. Uh, next week uh, we've got Badik Messer going to talk about approximate things, the air generating conjecture, and why I love thin sets. But uh, this week it's uh, Jason Kexing Ying who's going to tell us about probability theory and martingales. Over to you. All right. Well, thank you, Kevin, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, as the title suggests, I will be talking a bit about probability theory and uh, martingales. I will be talking about like um, the formalization of it in Lean and uh, some challenges we faced during the process. And um, yeah. Um, so as an overview of this uh, talk, uh, I will first be introducing you to um, the historical background, I guess, um, and uh, some intuitive ideas of uh, what a marking yell is and why we should care, I guess. <laughs> And then I will be defining some math definitions. So in particular, I will be defining what a condition expectation is. Uh, I would be defining, uh, you know, very useful definitions such as uh, stopping times and uh, filtration. And then finally, I will talk about martingales and the for especially the formalization of it in Lean. Uh, with that in mind, I will then give an a bo a bonus, I guess, of an application of martingale in a well-known theorem. So in particular, I would talk about um, the strong law of large numbers and the uh, proof of the strong law of large numbers using uh, something called a backwards martingale convergence theorem. Um, there seems to be something in the chat. I don't know if I'm... Oh, that was Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, yes. So um, there has been previous works on this. Um, yes. Um, from others um, in another formal language called um, Isabel. So there has been many work done by Herzl, um, Avigad, and I think uh, Sebastian, uh, uh, yeah, on, uh, on measure theory and um, probability theory alike. Uh, so in particular, they have formalized um, a large part of measure theory, uh, characteristic functions, uh, the, a large result, the central limit theorem they have formalized in Isabel. A condition expectation and uh, some a bit about Markov processes. Uh, so in particular, they used a different method than what we have do, uh, done in uh, MathLib. So in particular, they focused more on uh, uh, because their result is more on distribution functions. So in particular, they um, focused more about uh, using formalizing uh, probability theory using something called the Geary monad. Um, however, since we're used, um, we're dealing with general uh, random variables, uh, we don't need to care about distributions that much. So we didn't uh, done anything with monads, I guess. Um, so Remy uh, is a researcher in France. Uh, he wrote most of um, what we use in MATLAB nowadays uh, for probability theory. And in particular, he formalized the LP spaces. Um, he also uh, defined conditional expectation. And he also defined other probability um, definitions like uh, independence and um, you know, in, in particular, we're talking about independence of uh, sigma algebras. So, you know, we get a bunch of free results from that. Uh, so for the past few months and, you know, a bit before that, uh, so the foundation works as well. Uh, Remy and I have been working on uh, the Martingale project. So in particular, we're aiming to uh, formalize a lot of Martingale results and uh, use this to prove, you know, um, other results, I guess. So in particular, uh, as I mentioned previously, the uh, law of large numbers and Results like that. Um, yes. So, why do we care about martingales? So, you know, it's it's one of the most fundamental uh, objects in stochastic analysis. So, it's a very interesting object to study in general, and you have a bunch of really nice results from it. And uh, I think the proofs are beautiful intuitively as well as very formally. Um, on the other hand, if you don't really care about probability theory, as I know many people are not. Uh, uh, there are <laughs> probabilistic proofs of um, non-probability problems. In, so I, I don't know about um, what other people feel, but for me at least, probabilistic proofs of uh, non-probability problems are uh, one of the most beautiful proofs there is. Uh, so I found this a few months ago. So in particular, we have the fundamental theorem of algebra. You can prove it using um, Brownian motion. So the idea is um, if you have an um, entire function, so there's a theorem called Levy's theorem of invariance plan planar Brownian motion. Anyway, it essentially says that a Brownian motion um, composed with uh, entire map is also a Brownian motion. 
So if you have a function that's a, that's entire, but but omits a point, then you can consider uh, the composition of the boundary motion, and you can show that with pro a positive probability will wind around that uh, point, and so somehow you get a contradiction uh, by taking that path, which is homotopic to uh, zero uh, to the trivial loop, but then uh, the image is not. So anyway, um, it's a very nice proof with uh, using the, the brand new motions. Um, another result, which was very surprising when it was first brought out to me uh, by Yale Gillis, um, Cambridge undergraduate. Uh, he formalizes a lot of uh, combinatorics in Lean, and he was telling me about how I should do uh, Dupes convert uh, Dupes convergence theorem because he needed it to formalize something called the compactness of the space of graphons. So in particular, he needed the Martingale convergence theorem on a sequence of uniformly uh, distributed random variables. So that's a Martingale in that sense. Um, finally, one of the most famous probabilistic proofs for non-probability problems are is the Weierstrass approximation theorem. So that tells you that the uh, polynomials is dense in the space of continuous functions. So that uses a lot of large numbers and you uh, apply that to something called the Bernstein polynomials. Uh, finally, there is also applications in real life. So, um, you know, you can use it to model. So one of the most common uh, examples given to you what modern girls are useful is to model the stock market, I guess. Um, I don't really know much about this, but I believe it. I'm willing to believe that. Um, and it can be used to model, and uh, it's also useful in machine learning, I believe. Um, so as a general idea of Martingales, I will come back to the definitions later. Um, the main idea with Martingales is um, the following theorem. So the optional stopping theorem is uh, this theorem, which says uh, if X is a FM filter stochastic process, and if X is a Martingale, uh, then X is Martingale if and only if for all bounded stopping time T, uh, the expectation of the, stop, uh, the stochastic process at time t is equal to the original expectation. So in some sense, you can think about the stopping time as a rule for which when we stop a process, which uh, I will elaborate on this later. But, and then this theorem tells us that the expectation of a martingale at the stopping time does not change. So I have a quotation from Wikipedia here. Uh, so nothing can be gained from, uh, by stopping based on the information so far. And so this is somehow the, one of the most fundamental ideas about uh, martingales. And that's, you know, in, in some sense, it's the core of what, why we care about um, martingales uh, or, yeah. Uh, so in fact, Kevin uh, a few weeks ago uh, told me about, um, you know, a, a, like uh, I formalized one direction of the theorem and he said, uh, on Freak's 100 theorems list. Apparently, this is one of the three theorems that's not yet formalized in any theorem provers. So I think you know, it's a it's, um, very important result if it's on that list of uh, uh, 100 theorems, I guess. Uh, uh, so, why am I no longer sharing? Oh, no, I think I lost. Oh. Join. It's connecting. I don't know why it's not. I've had real problems with my copy, but I still can Yeah. Maybe I should. Uh, let me see. Let me, let me, I can't connect. Oh, I'm back in, I'm back in, back. I'm back. I'll give you a Which one are you? Oh, yeah. I lost Um, share screen, talk, share. Great, okay. I'm back. <laughs> okay, so onto the formal math. Um, Yes, so uh, the main idea with stochastic processes, um, a central idea is um, sigma algebras uh, models information. So in particular, in, um, in probability theory, if we're talking about the probability space right, instead of a me measure space, uh, we call 
the sigma algebra, the event space. So this is a very um, useful name, I guess, because it somehow models the possible events that can occur at a specific time. So if you think about it that way, uh, as a sigma algebra modeling event, possible events, then you can think about um, a, a smaller sigma algebra implies there's more information because there's less possible events, right? So given some information, we can limit the possible events. So we result in a smaller sigma algebra. So this is the main idea behind conditional expectation. So, uh, and here we have the formal definition. Sorry? Uh, yes. I, I would say a larger sigma algebra has more information. Uh, so in my case, right, so if we have a, a, some information, um, yes. then the number of possible events decreases, right, given that information. Is what I'm trying to I say. Think that's what you mean when you're looking at it. So, um, I think what you're thinking of, well, I don't want to hold you up already now, but it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> I think well, you're already kind of going ahead of things and saying when we do a conditional expectation, we, um, we um, assume that a certain amount of information is given and uh, we try to um, we try to do essentially a projection on the yes, given yes. this information, but really intrinsically, a larger sigma algebra um, contains more. If I if I if I condition on the full sigma algebra, at least we have oh, all the again. information, so I get the whole random variable back. Um, yes. Differently, if I look at a filtration people generally view it as something that has increasing information, not decreasing information. Um, yes, but I, I'm interpreting it in a different way, right? Yeah, I, I'm, 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 yes. <laughs> well, yeah, it depends on how you think about the uh, information, I guess. a large sigma algebra, I, get, I, I, I have more information, not less. Uh, in in some sense, yes. Um, let me just email the talk to Kevin so I can uh, can uh, share my screen on that screen. Oh, you're gonna give up? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, because I I think it keeps disconnecting me, which is not good. Uh, documents. Presentation. Okay, I can make my point a bit clearer. If I think of a trivial sigma <laughs> yes, algebra, yes. Yes. Yeah, so it contains only the whole set and zero, yes. then it contains no information except for the expectation of the random variable in the condition of that. Yeah, okay, I get it. Because, uh, you're saying that the information, you're talking the information about the random variable, right? Well, or just generally. I mean, the trivial sigma algebra contains zero information It only contains because it only contains the whole set and the empty set. I'm thinking that uh, it uh, the trivial sigma algebra contains a lot of information because the only possible, if you have a random variable that's uh, measurable with respect to the trivial sigma algebra, the okay. possible okay. events are also. Yeah, but then yeah. what you're trying to say is that something that is has, that's forced to be measurable with, with respect to a small sigma algebra has few out possible. Yes, yeah, that's what I'm trying so to say. You know a lot already about yes. the shape it has. Yes. But I'd be careful with this formulation okay. because in general, people will say that the information, that the amount of available information increases as the, uh, as the sigma algebras get larger. Okay, yes. Yeah, it's an intu intuition thing, I guess, or like, you know, how yeah, you phrase I, it. Yes. Um, but yes, I, I agree with you. Um, and that's, in fact, how I, um, you know, how Wikipedia described it as well, I think. Um, I just didn't quite. Oh, you mean, yeah, okay. No, yeah, Wikipedia uh, it, didn't take your definition of Wikipedia. Yeah, Wikipedia was uh, with agreeing with you in the sense that um, larger sigma algebra is uh, more information, but I interpreted the notion of information in the other sense that, it, you know, uh, yes, but it's certainly good to bring up. I okay. don't know anything about Windows. Uh, <laughs> full screen mode. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. okay. Yeah, that's fine. That's great. Uh, let's go back to that slide. Uh, yes, but well, that's not well on the intuition, I guess. It's uh, it's lean, right? So it's very formal. Uh, 
So um, yes, so how is condition expectation defined? Uh, well, condition expectation, um, so if F is an integrable random variable on a probability space, and if we have a sub-sigma algebra G of F, then the F, um, then a condition expectation of F with respect to the sub-sigma algebra uh, is that G random uh, variable, so it's measurable with respect to the sub-sigma algebra, um, F tilde such that the integral, the integral equation here holds, for all uh, measurable sets in G. Uh, and we denote it by you know, the probability notation where we take the expectation of F with respect to G. Uh, so here we just have a proposition of what, uh, what property a condition expectation should have, right? Uh, and we can say the condition expectation, um, so since it exists and is uh, essentially unique in the measure theory sense uh, in that uh, because Radonikadim theorem tells us such a function is, uh, exists and is essentially unique. Uh, so intuitively, or yes, so we can think about this as a projection, as um, you have previously uh, mentioned. So what we do is, um, so if we consider L2, um, so uh, L2 space is special in the sense that it is a Hilbert space, right, along, among all LP spaces. Um, and it's a Hilbert space, and then, um, so if I have a sigma algebra, um, it is a close, so uh, if I have a sub-sigma algebra, then the LT space with respect to the sub-sigma algebra is a closed subspace of the original LT space. Uh, so with that, we can just simply take a function and then we can project it uh, onto this, uh, the closed subspace and that gives us a conditional expectation. Um, However, traditionally, we normally don't define it this way. So normally what we do is we uh, use the random nickname theorem. Can I say something about this too? Yes, go ahead. So I come from a world where we like to consider um, random variables taking values in uh, general Banach spaces. Yes. And um, then the random nickname theorem is actually not a good approach to defining the conditional expectation because not every Banach space has a random nickname property. Yes, I will. Projection uh, approach combined with the um, approximation argument in L1 actually, I think is it is better. Yes, and I will come to it. Yes, I will come to it, and that's in fact how Lin defines stuff. So I will provide uh, <laughs> provide um, you know a process of how Lin does define it, which is exactly what you said. We take the uh, L2 and you take a density arguments in L1. You can get the Condition expectation in open R spaces. But uh, yes, yeah, so I would just quickly mention the rather negative theorem uh, because uh, I had proved this uh, last summer uh, in Lean. And uh, so I just want to quickly mention this. Uh, yes, and that's how we uh, at Imperial uh, undergrad defines condition expectation as well. It's so. nice way to do it. Yeah. Um, yes, so the rather negative theorem says that given measures uh, mu and nu, such that nu is absolutely continuous with respect to mu, there exists the essentially unique measurable function f such that nu is equal to f nu. Uh, so in particular, essentially unique means that um, it's unique up to a, uh, a equal, right? So it's, um, you know, if another function is satisfied, then it's almost everywhere equal to this function. Uh, we call this function f uh, the rather like derivative and we denote it by this uh, derivative looking uh, notation. Um, so the rather linkedin theorem works straight away for uh, real sign and complex measures. So in particular, the proof of uh, all of these cases follows by taking the real case, uh, proving the real case first, we extend in it to the sign case using Jordan decomposition and then uh, get the complex from the sign version. Uh, and we, ca we can see that from the following chain of inequality, just check in uh, definition and check in notations um, that in fact, um, the rather linkedin derivative, if you take the correct uh, uh, restriction of the measures, you get the correct definition for the conditional expectation. So this is one way of doing things. Um, and however, we would like uh, rather nicotine uh, property for a larger class, right? So um, so rather nicotine property is um, holds on a space if the rather nicotine theorem is true. And um, in, in fact, there's some theorems I found online. I have no idea how to prove this. Um, that you know, a Banach space has a rather nickname property if it's reflexive or, or is a separable dual space. 
all Hilbert spaces have uh, the Rademachian property. Uh, however, we don't want to prove um, a theorem like this for every space we want to work with. Right? We would rather obtain junk for spaces um, that doesn't have RMP or doesn't have you know, um, condition expectations. So it's somewhat too strong. So this is a bad way of doing things in lean, especially. Right? Uh, so the idea is we follow back to the L2 projection case and um, we can define it like this. So first step, we define, as I've said previously, we define uh, the condition expectation as an orthogonal projection. Uh, so this works for indicative functions. And so in particular, we can think about L1 interpolated functions. And then um, we can um, define uh, by the density of um, uh, simple functions in L1, we can, we can extend the definition linearly um, of conditional expectations to all functions in L1. And then we obtain a general conditional expectation by uh, obtaining junk for uh, the cases where it's not well defined. So in particular, uh, if it's not measurable or not integrable, then we obtain, I, I believe the uh, junk value is zero, but yes. Uh, so in particular, this step is very similar to how we constructed the Bochner integral in uh, Lean. And um, it's a very, you know, very nice process to extend uh, stand definitions like this, and we have a whole in file dedicated to this particular method of extending definitions. Uh, we reuse the Bochner stuff. Uh, yes, yes. So we have a thing called set to L1. So it's a way of uh, extending um, definitions uh, from L1 uh, like this, right? I, in fact, that's that's the file you were referring to a few. Uh, I think last month where we were talking about how many universe levels are there and that's why has the most universe levels. <laughs> yes, but yes, we can reuse the code uh, for Bachman integral here for the condition expectations. That's a very nice thing, I think. Um, yes, yeah, so in particular, we can talk about the condition expectation of on um, any second countable Banner space. So in particular, this is the definition we have in me. So you see that we don't, you know, other than the basic definitions required for the definition of the Bachner integral, um, we don't really require anything else. Uh, maybe we require sigma finiteness, um, but yeah, we don't really require anything. We obtain, we don't even require measurable or integrable here, right? The mu dot tree is the restriction. Yes, the, so it's mu restricted on the sub sigma algebra. So you have um, uh, M is the overall sigma algebra and uh, M zero is the sub sigma algebra. And HM is a proposition that M is a sub sigma algebra of, uh, oh, sorry, my bad. It's M0 is the overall sigma algebra and M is the sub sigma algebra. HM is a proposition that M is a sub sigma algebra of M0. And trim trims uh, mu, restricts mu onto the sub sigma algebra. So the inequality is the sub, the, the smaller thing is the sub. Yes, yes. So M is the sub of M0. Um, yes, and we introduce the notation similar to the, the, the the probability notation here, which is very useful because we have otherwise very, very long and messy um, uh, declarations. Okay, with that behind, uh, let us talk about filtrations. So, um, okay, so uh, uh, you you disagree, but um, in my mind, uh, <laughs> in my mind, uh, you know, um, filtration is something that that describe less information in the future, right? <laughs> so, so in that sense, if you have, um, if you have a stochastic process, you, you know less what the stochastic process will do in the future. So therefore there's more possible events, less information, but it's a, uh, you know, it's hard to interpret it, but it might not be very accurate. Um, but anyway, uh, so definition of filtration. Um, so if, you're, uh, if Omega f mu is a measure space, then the filtration on this measure space is simply a sequence of uh, increasing sub sigma algebras of f. So all of these are less equal to the main sigma algebra, I guess, but it's increasing at each step. Um, so, and then uh, the main um, main point of is filtration, right? You, you, the idea, um, with the filtration, you want to adapt it to a uh, sequence of random variables, right? Otherwise, we don't know how this random variables behave with respect to this filtration. So in particular, we define a stochastic process to be adapted to a filtration if at each step, 
FM is FM measurable. So, uh, yes. Uh, I mean, you can define it, but I don't. Sure, but then you can always define, and you can always consider the signature of what generates that. Yeah, yeah. But it's real by the. Yes. Uh, yes, and in fact, that's uh, that's a good point, and. Um, so technically, you can take the uh, the the, uh, the sigma algebra generated by uh, of the union of these ones, um, and that's uh, so uh, later I will define stop process, and there's something called a measurable space generated by the stop process. Uh, no, uh, stopping time, sorry, um, and that requires um, a sigma algebra similar to this, where you uh, where the this sigma algebra is defined to be something intersected with the uh, uh, join of all sigma algebras in the filtration. Um, but yeah, that's very technical, and I don't want to get into it. Um, is there a bundle of sigma algebra? Uh, yes. These FN sub objects are there. Yeah, they're bundled, right? I mean, I mean the sub algebras. The sigma algebras? Uh, the sub sigma algebras. Yeah. They are not bundled. So the all the FNs are kind of tight, tight terms. Um, yes, they're they're uh, class instances. Uh -huh. Right. I mean, we can bundle it, but I don't really see the point because. So you've just got maps between them. It's all. Uh, I mean, you can consider these as maps, I guess, or you know, yeah, in the proposition that one is less equal to the other one. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can bundle it together, but. Oh, I don't see, you have inequalities of the. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's beneficial to bundle them because then the type class instances will have a hard time finding finding the correct measurable space, which is already happening. It like it, uh, in the definition of filtration, right? It's very simple. It's just exactly what I defined it to be. Uh, you have a sequence mapping to a measurable space. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's monotone, and uh, all of these are less equal to the overall sigma algebra. Um, however, this is you know since it's bundled. It cannot, um, so Lin have a hard time finding the correct sigma algebra. So when, whenever I want to um, prove something, it will complain that, oh, this sigma algebra is not correct. It's expecting this one, but it inferred another sigma algebra. Um, so it, it can be fixed somewhat. Uh, it's not a full fix by changing most instances of um, measurable space to an implicit argument instead. You've got uh, a lot of measurables. You've got a lot of measurables. Yeah. Spaces. There's a lot of measurable space instances on alpha. Yeah, it can be uncountable, right? It doesn't really matter. You just have to have pre-order on it on IOTA. So it's a lot of sigma uh, sigma algebras. Lean can, for the most part, know which one is correct, but it cannot infer the one most of the time. So it knows which one is correct, but it cannot infer the correct one. Uh, and it can be somewhat fixed by changing measurable space to implicit argument. Uh, but uh, as you can see here, it doesn't fix huh. all the time. So for example, we have a lot of underscores um, because Lean cannot, doesn't know that um, I want to use the FI, so the filtration, um, evaluated I that gave us an uh, sigma algebra. That's the correct one to use here. However, it infers so, uh, the overall one. So in this case will be M. So it infers that way instead and complains that, oh, you, I can't find the correct sigma algebra. If there's an at in your code, then uh, the purists regard you as having failed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's something wrong with your definition. Yeah, so somehow. Nothing here, nothing that you're not saying. Yeah. The implementation. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know how to fix this. And um, you know, this is like the definition itself seems the most natural way of de defining it. And it's how they define it. And they, mm, it's similar how they define it in this spell, but I don't think they have the same type class instance as we do. Um, anyway, moving on. So now I will define what the stopping time is. So, um, so stopping time um, describes a rule to which we stop a process. So, so the formal definition is this. So I will only be talking about um, discrete stochastic processing this time. Um, yeah, because that's 
you know, some somehow continuous ones has more nuance and we need to define some uh, class of code Cadillac. Uh, and uh, we don't have the theories yet. So uh, I just stick to the discrete. Um, so a function T, uh, which was domain, uh, the sample space to the code domain mapped with uh, infinity is called a stopping time. Um, or, you know, the, the code domain can be any pre-order set. Um, with respect to your filtration f, and if for all i in the the code domain, uh, this set is measurable, right? Um, you know, yeah, it, infinity is um, so f infinity is not defined. Right? Oh. Now I'll come. Do you have an i in n u d infinity? Yes, but in some sense it's not defined, and I will de uh, show you a problem with this uh, this problem where we have uh, infinity here right so in in the literatures i've read they have infinity and they just said this is not defined in the case that they, we don't care about the case where uh, uh, the stopping time is infinity yeah but the reason is that the event that the stop that the stopping time takes the value infinity is um is the complement of the union of all other possible outcomes. So it's automatically in the sigma algebra yes. generated by. Uh, but so it is in that. So it is in that. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's in, even in the sigma algebra generated by the yeah. But that's uh, the thing is, that's only true for discrete case, right? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what you're doing with discrete case. Yes, in this case, it's fine. Um, I was discussing with Lucas about this. And then uh, I think Kevin actually gave the counter example where he took the <laughs> code you made to be the ordinals, I think. <laughs> yeah. And then we had the problem. <laughs> but I don't think anyone's working with the uh, ordinal code you made. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, but I mean, you yes. would only look at a code domain that corresponds with the set that's indexing your processes. Yes. yes. But he meant that in arbitrary free order, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. Because why not? Right? This is not how the game works. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so in that case, so you know, it, the current lean definition is exactly this, and we don't really care in the case that it's real or and it works for real as well because you can just you know uh, embed naturals into reals and take the union of that. But um, you know, in the case of ordinals, then it doesn't work. But I don't think anyone is working with ordinal stopping times. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then um, right. So given the stochastic uh, stopping time, we define the stop process. Um, so a you know, stop process formally is defined to be, um, if you have a stochastic process Fn and a stopping time T, then we define the stop process Ft uh, by this. So in particular, the, the wedge means the minimum. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so you see that once, uh, if T is not reached, uh, so if t omega is some number, right, then before the stopping time has been reached, uh, the stop process is just the same as the stochastic process itself. But after it has been reached, then it's just a constant. And I will illustrate this by uh, uh, a text diagram, which I've drawn. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so if you consider the random walk on the integers, right? So if you imagine here is um, zero and here is minus one, one. Um, and I define the stopping time to be the infimum of n greater than equal to zero, such that f n uh, omega equals one. So that means that uh, the first time the realization of the stochastic process reaches one, that's when we, when we will stop. Uh, so in particular, if we have a, a realization here, so if omega, and it goes down, goes up, go up, and then here we have it reached one at uh, t equals four, right? So then afterwards, uh, the stop process will be just constant after here. So that's uh, what the stop process do. So after we reach the stopping uh, or the stopping rule has been achieved, the stochastic process will stop. Um, so I don't know much. Um, anyway, I just come up with a quick example of how it might be useful. So, um, so it's very useful to create indices. Right? In particular, if you have a sequence of stopping time defined like this, um, you can check that if you take uh, limb n to infinity, it equals the limb sum. In particular, the index here provides us with a particular index for the limb sub sequence. So I think this is uh, kind of useful. And then 
uh, you know, with this, you can con conclude that a bounded stochastic process is a point-wise convergent sub process. Uh, but anyway, this uh, this doesn't have any use. But yeah, I think it's a cute application of stopping time. Um, yes. So back to the problem where we have infinity. So the code domain has infinity. So what should we do there? Um, so the sub process is fine, right? Because mathematically we take the minimum with n. So it, the infinity uh, minimum uh, taking the minimum of infinity and n is also always n, right? So the the stochastic so process uh, stop process is always well defined for any omega. However, there's another definition uh, called the stop value uh, that where we just define it to be uh, the stochastic process at the stopping time, and it, if uh, if the stopping time is finite and otherwise it's undefined. Um, so if you work with lean, uh, you know, this definition is problematic. Uh, so in particular, we do not like partial functions, right? So in particular in lean, uh, one over zero is def defined to be zero, right? We, we all do. Yes. And I could imagine that this definition is also unfortunate when you want to do multiple convergence theorems because then you would want to uh, want to actually consider any the any Yes, yes. So, you know, it's, um, I, I, don't, I don't see how we need F infinity for the that case. Well, if you, so F infinity would be your limiting. Uh, oh, you define the infinity to be the limit, yes. Okay, yes, in that case, sure. Um, but yeah, we haven't gone that far yet. <laughs> so we have not reached, but yes, I'll keep that in mind when we start to formalize uh, the, the convergence theorems. Um, but yeah, so partial functions are problematic in lean. Um, and it's difficult to, uh, because infinity somehow, uh, the stop, uh, stopping rule might not be achieved, right? So we need some value for the stopping time in the case that the stopping rule is not achieved. So we somehow need the infinity there, but it's difficult to, uh, difficult to do. And there's two potential fixes for this. Uh, one is just ignore it. <laughs> Uh, so with finite or uh, bound, uh, you know, in particular, all the theorems I proved so far is working with bounded stopping time. So, you know, it's it's fine so far. Um, uh, also, uh, before I uh, talk about the second fix, um, you see that we have composed the stopping time with the index here. So therefore, we need the index. Uh, so since lean is type theory based, right? So the index must have the same type as the codomain of the stopping time. But that means the index of the stochastic a process must equal to, uh, must be the same as the codomain of the stopping time, uh, which means that the, if I'm talking about a discrete stochastic process, then I must have an F infinity somewhere, um, you know, which is normally you don't define the F infinity. For, I, yes. No, no, it's fine. Just, uh, so wouldn't it make sense to consider two types of stochastic processes, one for which F infinity exists because it is actually quite a natural situation that mm -hmm. you can encounter and one where it does not exist. And then for the ones where it does exist, well, it's just a bit with index set and there you can allow a final, then you just say the values for which the stopping time must exist should coincide with the, uh, with the index set. Yes, and uh, that's one potential fix. Uh, <laughs> uh, so in particular, we have, we just promote, so if in the case that the stochastic process have, you know, finite uh, or a natural number as index without infinity, we can promote it up such that it agrees with your definition. So in particular, we give it a junk value. But the problem with this is that um, we're passing around a lot of, uh, passing around a lot of um, values. So the types keep changing. And in some sense, that's very difficult to work with. So in measure theory, we work with something called the extended uh, non-negative real numbers. And that's, ex uh, that's non-negative real numbers um, uh, encod uh, encoded in a monad called with top. Um, so, so in that sense, it's similar to that case where we pass around the real value, un underlying real value, um, sometimes with infinity. Uh, but then we have a lot of coercion between the different types. And that is difficult to work with because we need to create a new set of um, lemmas, APIs for each of those types. So that, that's the problem, a problematic part, but we've done it for uh, the non uh, extended non-negative real numbers. So we can do it here as well. We just need to duplicate a lot of code. That, that's the main thing. Yes. But 
it's not exactly what I suggested because I suggested to have uh, f infinity to not hit zero necessarily. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, saying it's the correct yeah. answer. Yeah. Yeah, in the case it is, uh, it has infinity, then that's fine, right? I'm saying in the case it doesn't have infinity. Uh, then you want to set it zero. Or yes, uh, at infinity. As so a, you want to set it to be something. Yeah, yeah. 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 And zero is the only thing you know exists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's a junk value. Yeah. yeah. That's just how we deal with problems like this, I guess. Um, yeah, so far, no major problem, but I think, yes, you have uh, told us. I yeah. Think that's for most it, it will probably work. I, I think it will work. It's just, it's going to be annoying to pass around types. Um, but we will we'll see. <laughs> Um, yes, finally, the main, main, the, the name of the talk, the uh, Martingales. Uh, so what are Martingales? Well, if I have a filter, sigma finite filtered measure space, so it's a measure space equipped with the filtration, uh, then a sequence of F measurable functions is called a Martingale if it's integrable, uh, and they satisfy this equation. So for all A in a, at o, uh, o time index N and all A in the filtration at N, then the integral of the next step equals the integral of the previous step. So equivalently, using the formulation of the condition expectation, you're just simply saying that the condition expectation of the next step with respect to the previous filtration is equal to the current stochastic process. Um, so adaptedness is embedded in this definition. So we well, have not talked, uh, said anything about adaptedness here, but you know, since it has to be integral, it has to be measurable. Um, so that's fine in the definition. If we replace the equality with a less equal or a greater equal, then, then we get a uh, we get a definition of a super slash uh, sub martingale, which are arguably more interesting um, because you, you want to model stuff. You know, you know, stuff is not always constant, right? Uh, if you have a stock, then you, you would ex you would want it to go up, right? So then, in that case, you want a sub martingale <laughs> rather than a yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. So in Lean, we have conditional expectations. So it's just simply uh, defined with uh, the conditional expectation. But in that case, if we remember that conditional expectation does not require measurability nor integrability, we will need to make sure that adaptiveness is included. Right? Otherwise, we don't know how the stochastic process behaves with respect to the filtration. And uh, the property where the integral property is known as set in Broek. Yeah. This equals n is up to a certain measure zero. Uh, yes, it's almost everywhere you call, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I almost, I didn't say it here, but yeah, it's almost everywhere you call. Yeah. With probability theory, all, all the equal signs are almost, almost always, almost uh, everywhere you call. Uh, yes. And we'll come back to the option of stopping there. Um, so, yes. So, um, you know, now with the definitions in mind, uh, this, definition actually makes sense. And um, if we have formalized one direction of it uh, for uh, sub martingales, or you know, it, it's the same for super martingales. So in particular, the theorem is the following. So if we have stopping times pi and ta, uh, pi, uh, tau and pi, and uh, f is a sub martingale, and um, uh, yeah, tau and pi are stopping times, and the tau is less equal to pi, um, and pi is bound is bounded stop stopping time, then the, uh, the expectation of the stop value at tau is less equal to the stop value at pi. So you see that it's a generalization of the the martingale case, right? Because all martingales are sub martingales. They are both sub martingales as well as super martingales. Um, yeah. So this is one direction of it. We need to prove the reverse direction, and then we have uh, knocked off. One uh, one out of three lemmas, uh, one out of three remaining theorems on the Freak's hundred theorems list. Yes. <laughs> um, so yes. So uh, Remy and I have been working on the Martingale project for the past three months. So since Christmas. Uh, so in particular, these are some of the goals we hope to accomplish with this project. So um, Ergorov theorem is um, just a measure theory theorem, which says. Um, um, a sequence of almost every convergent uh, functions converges uniformly on an arbitrarily large set. So it's a very nice theorem uh, in measure theory. Um, option you theorem. It, right? Yes, uh, and the next slide I will say what we've done so far. Yes. 
Yes. <laughs> I marked it. Yes, you marked it. Um, yes, an optional stopping theorem, I just mentioned previously. Convergence dimension, so that's kind of surprising. We did not have that in MATLAB yet. Um, it, it's one of the more fundamental notions of convergence in measure theory as well as probability. So we don't have that yet, but we will. Um, uniform integrability and Vitalis convergence theorem. So uniform integrability is vital for the convergence uh, for uh, for proving the convergence theorem, and um, Vitalis convergence theorem is very useful as well, and it's somewhat a generalization of the dominated convergence theorem. Um, then you have the dupe subcrossing lemma. So this is a lemma that gave me a lot of pain because uh, <laughs> it's it's very um, the the proof of it is very. Hand wavy, yes. Well, you yeah. can make it formal, but I can see why. It's yeah, similar. yeah. I mean, the idea is you you consider a band, and then you uh, count the number of times the stop, uh, the realization of the stop process crosses that band, and then you need to realize some properties. So, for example, if the number of upcrossings is is um, it's not finite, then the sequence does not converge, right? Because it never goes within the epsilon neighborhood. So. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of properties from that definition is very intuitive, yet it's very hard to formalize. Um, so this has been giving me a lot of trouble. Uh, I have the definition, but I'm not proved much of the properties. Um, convergence theorem, you know, that's one of the main results that we want to achieve with this, um, with this um, project, and it has a lot of applications. Uh, maximum inequality, levy subcore theorem, you know, more advanced stuff. We're not really close to that yet, but. We hope to get there some someday. Um, so so far, you know, uh, Ergorov theorem. Uh, I submitted that as uh, part of my uh, my coursework for Kevin's uh, course. Um, optional. Uh, so that's PR and it's MATLAB. Uh, optional stopping theorem. Uh, the, the discrete version, the one direction, is in MATLAB. Uh, the other direction is not that much harder, and it should be in MATLAB soon once I get time. To do it, convergence in measure that's uh, 400 lines PR that's currently um, in review. Uh, I, I hope it gets merged soon. Uh, uniform integrability, Vitalis convergence theorem. So, we, uh, yeah, pull request, yes. PR is pull request. Um, yes, uniform integrability. We have the definition, we have proofs, many of the properties, such as, the, you know, if you have a single function that is uniformly integrable, it's actually surprisingly hard to. Um, proof. <laughs> uh, be, I mean, it's especially because uh, the uniform integrability I've defined is more general than the one um, that's found in literature. Uh, so, in particular, I've generalized it for O. So, in particular, the un normally uniform integrability you talk about the integral uh, is uniformly bounded by some uh, epsilon uh, delta. Um, but I would like the LP, uh, the LP norm, to be uniformly uh, bounded by something, right? So Yes, uh, go ahead. No, but uh, it's okay. Oh, okay. No, but uh, I mean, it's, I'm, not, it's not the uniform bound, it's the you know, but you know that, of course, in this. Yeah, yeah, I just, <laughs> I, it's just, um, yeah, it's very, I mean, I don't have it with, I don't have the, I didn't type it off. <laughs> That's the problem, right? Um, yeah, and uh, Vitalik's convergence theorem, um, you know, I've done one direction of it, and then since the other direction, uh, or, you know, it, it requires convergence in measures, I'm waiting for the definition for that uh, to be merged. Uh, of course, in lemma, I've started it. I have the definition of the uh, of course, it's hard to prove that must not it. Uh, and then the three, I have not even, you know, we need of course, in lemma to prove the rest. So, so you know, that, that's the um, part we are at right now. Uh, so finally, um, you have to, yeah. Um, so as um, you know, as an application of Martingales, so why do we care about Martingales? You know, I'm gonna prove the strong law of large numbers using the backwards Martingale convergence theorem. Uh, Is that what you have? Or? No, I'm just you know, as the, the end, I want to show you why do we care about this, right? What's coming. Yeah, what's coming? Why? And this is one of the results that we hope to achieve, right? Um, so yeah, it's just one of the applications. Uh, so you know, with uh, morning convergence, you use dupe subcrossing also as well for uh, to prove this one. So where we have a backward filtration, and you can prove that this conditional expectation converges almost everywhere, and L one to uh, that um, yeah. 
Um, so, you know, if you recall what a strong law of large number is, um, the normal proof is very uh, long and cal uh, calculation based if you don't use martingales. Um, so here we use martingales and it's much easier and much nicer. So if, uh, so the strong law of large number says, if Fn is a sequence of independent integrable identically distributed random variables, then the average converges to the expectation uh, almost everywhere in L1. And the weak version says conversion in probability, but that one follows straight away from Markov inequality. So that one's trivial. Um, and the proof of this follows by constructing a backwards filtration such that this uh, uh, that equality holds and the construction I've omitted here because it's technical. Um, and then by symmetry, because F, uh, F is uh, identically independently distributed, we have that equality. And so, uh, n times this one is the same thing as summing over it. Uh, and then because of linearity of conditional expectation, we get it's equal to the expectation of SN over SN. So that's just itself, right? Because SN is uh, is measurable with respect to the sigma algebra generated by SN. So hence uh, dividing both that by N, we get uh, the, uh, the average is e uh, almost everywhere equal to the conditional expectation there. And that's um, you know exactly what we need for the backwards martingale conversion theorem. So we get that, uh, we get the, uh, we get the convergence almost everywhere in quality uh, and in L1. And finally, we, by noting that, uh, so if you recall what F is, so F is uh, the conditional expectation over the, the uh, intersection of all backwards filtrations. Um, we have that the, uh, we have like Komogorov of the, uh, yes. So the conditional expectation is equal, right? Because that, in that's um, because omega, the whole sample space is um, is measurable in any sigma algebra. So therefore, you can take the integral, and that's fine. And by Komogorov zero one law, f is constant. So we have uh, um, f is equal to the expectation almost everywhere as required. And that's a proof of the strong law of large numbers. And that's the end of my talk. Uh, so I will be, is there any questions? Thank you. Uh, yes, I will. Uh, How do I stop the recording? <laughs> More. Uh, stop recording.